Okay, so here's a spoiler alert. This video will include a lot of theory that you should have developed yourself, or hypotheses that you should have developed yourself while solving the exercise sheet. So do only watch this video and do only look at the slides after having solved um, exercise sheet 2. So assuming that you are in this position, else now push stop, um, one of the things that you might have noticed is that the order of the state update matrix is always equal to the longest period that you observe with the LFSR. So let's phrase this as a theorem. So let's put it as a definition. Uh, assume that the order is L for this state update matrix C, then the longest period generated by this LFSR is L, the same L. And the state, which is all zeros followed by a one, is a starting state which achieves this maximal period L. Well, this is how far I assume you've gotten, and maybe you have even theorized how you could prove it. So let's do this proof together. So first of all, what happens when I iterate from this S0 onwards? Well, at S0, I have n minus 1 zeros and 1 1 at the end. And then as I update my state, I'm outputting zeros, and this 1 moves forward one step at a time. And afterwards, well, I put stars there because I don't know what it is. So once I've reached state as i, then I have n minus 1 minus i zeros, then a 1, and then a whole bunch of stars. And then the way that you typically prove such a theorem is that you assume on the contrary that it's not true. So it was the same when we tried to prove um, that the period divides every repetition frequency. So also here, let's assume that there is some other number r which is less than the period l, or less than the order l, which already is the period. And I'm proving this just for this S0, so these Si are the states that are updates from this S0. So if you find that for all i you have that Si is equal to Sr plus i, that means, well, there's a periodicity with period r, then we're using again how the state update matrix works, so that was S1 is S0 times C, and then you iterate this multiple times, so Si is C to the i with an S0 in front of it. So what we have here is I'm starting with the definition that we just picked. So I'm starting with the periodicity, so Si equals Sr plus i, and then I'm replacing only the r-fold application of the state matrix and keeping the si here the same as it was. So I'm getting si times c to the r. And by definition of the order, c to the r is not the identical mat the identity matrix. And this holds for any i larger than zero. So let's write this down for the first n such states. So I'm putting in the first row the s0, s1, s2, till sn minus 1. And remember, from up there, these are, well, S0 is a whole bunch of zeros followed by 1, and then fewer and fewer zeros. And then each of those is equal to itself times c to the r. So what I'm writing there is just, let's call this big matrix S. Then I'm getting a matrix equation that S equals S times c to the r. And this S matrix, well, it has n rows, and each row has n entries because each state has length n. And then by the property of, the, of how these vectors are defined, um, they are all linearly independent because each vector that comes in has a, has a 1 in a position where a previous one only had a 0. So there's nothing that is n minus 1 could depend on because, well, it's the only one which has the 1 in the very first position. And then sn minus 2 is the only one, all since we eliminated this one, and so on and so forth. So you're getting that this s is invertible. That's what it means that the, column, uh, that the rows are linear independent. Well, if it's invertible, that's inverted. So let's multiply from the left by s inverse. Well, when you get uh, s inverse times s, that is just the identity matrix. And then let's also do this on the right hand side. So there we now have S inverse times S times C to the R, 
well, again, the S inverse and the S cancel out. And so we're getting that the identity matrix is equal to C to the R. But that contradicts the assumption made up there that C to R is not the identity matrix. So, well, the only thing that we put in here is that R is less than L, so R has to be equal to L. Okay, so at this point we have proven the assumption that we have developed in solving the exercises that by computing the order of R, we're not just getting uh, kind of the maximum of the periods. We do know already that the period of every sequence divides the order of R, but we also have now shown that there exists at least one sequence which achieves this order, and we get one of those if we're starting with S0. Okay, what else have we observed? Well, we computed this characteristic polynomial P, which is the characteristic polynomial of this matrix, and you should have noticed that that was always the same as the matrix. Well, you didn't check this everywhere, you checked this in certain cases, namely, I asked you to only compute the order of irreducible polynomials. But in case that P was irreducible, you have seen that the order of this characteristic polynomial equals the order of C. Now that has a reason in the definition of characteristic polynomial because, well, I only showed the definition of using this determinant, but the, the mathematical definition just says that this is the a polynomial which satisfies that when you plug in C as the coefficient, so that, I have to explain that a little bit, um, that means you're taking C to the n whenever you see an x to the n. So you're just computing powers of C the same way that we have, and so then this becomes a polynomial equation in matrices. So if there's a coefficient that is 1, then you're adding that thing, and if there's a 0, well, you don't do anything. And the the polynomial means that when you compute the, these powers and sum them up, you're getting 0. So that means when you're looking at x modulo p of x, that satisfies the same equation as c. And so you can interchange the roles of c and x in all places. Well, x modulo p of x. And the order of p was defined as the order of x modulo p of x, and so those two are the same. And so in our experiments, the ones we looked at, so there was the one sequence which was um, sj plus 2 is equal to sj plus sj plus 1, and for that one we observe that it has order 3 for the state update matrix, and also for this characteristic polynomial, and that the characteristic polynomial was irreducible, and also for the next one, which was characteristic polynomial x to the 3 plus x plus 1, um, that one is also irreducible, and the polynomial and the matrix at order 7. For the other examples that I gave you, those had a, had a reducible characteristic polynomial, so I didn't ask you to compute the order of P. So just as a reminder of the definition, um, if F is irreducible, that means if you have any factorization of F, so if F splits into a product of G times H, so can you split it? Well, yes, but only if the degree of one of them is zero, meaning that the polynomial is a constant. So you can write your, uh, your f as a product 1 times f itself or f times 1. If it's not irreducible, it's called reducible. And you should have seen one test for irreducibility uh, due to Rabin. And so um, since we're going to use some properties of this, let me repeat it here. So if you have a polynomial over some finite field fq and of degree n, and then you're asking yourself, is this irreducible? Then there are two steps you have to check. Namely, you have to check that this polynomial f divides, and okay, I've been trying to color code because there's a lot of information coming in. So it divides f x to the q, which is the size of the final field, and then to the n, where n is the degree of the polynomial. And then that minus x. Okay, that's the first property. And then also for every divisor of n, and we only care about the interesting divisors, so we don't care about um, d equals to n, but we do care about 1, for instance, um, we do check that the GCD of f with x to the q and now to the d instead of to the n minus x is 1. So for d equals n, the GCD is f, because f is a divisor, and for all the other ones, it must not be a divisor or any factor of 
f minus the real divisor. Well, if f is irreducible, there are no non-trivial factors, and so there shouldn't be anything else. And so if you have these two properties satisfied, then your polynomial f is irreducible. If you ever have to check this, then you can save yourself a little bit of effort. So if you write your n the degree as uh, pi to the ei, so pi's are primes and ei's are integers larger than 1, then you only need to check the second condition for all d's which are n divided by p. So only divided by pi, not by pi to various powers or combinations of those primes. Simple reason, um, if you just divide off by one p, then all the other pieces, all the combinations are in this n. And so if it would divide one of those, it will also divide the product there. Now, the reason I repeat this here is that it gives us an idea of what to check for when we're looking for periods or for the orders. So if f is irreducible, that means f divides x to the q to the n minus x. So let's split this up. So then we have x to the q to the n is common to x modulo f of x. And since we're asking for the order, we're not asking for a power which gives x again, but we're asking for a power which gives 1. So we divide those sides by x, and we're getting that x to the q to the n minus 1 is common to 1 modulo f of x for an irreducible f. And that was the reason why I suggested that you check the orders for the irreducible factors, because we can develop some theory of what these degrees are, or what these orders are. So first of all, we notice that the order is a divisor of q to the n minus 1. Now, our q's are always 2, so that is very nice to work with. And then depending on what we're looking at, there might not be many divisors. So we can easily exclude a whole bunch and only check a few. All right, so here are the examples that we have looked at so far. So this is, again, the x squared plus x plus 1, uh, which is irreducible itself. The degree of this polynomial is 2. And then we look at this formula that I just had on the slide, this q to the n minus 1. So q is 2 and n is 2 here as well. So I'm looking at 2 squared minus 1. So 4 minus 1 is 3. And I know that the order of this polynomial has to be divisor of 3. Obviously, x is not congruent to one modular polynomial, so the order has to be 3. The only divisors of 3 are 3 itself and 1. And anything which is lower than the degree of the polynomial can't be the order of the polynomial. Similarly, if I look at the second example, this had x cubed plus x plus 1, and we computed that the order was 7. And we could have actually done this without any computation. That's why I said, hey, lots of spoilers around here, because once you know this, you will not start computing anymore. You'll just use your brain. You will look at, hey, the degree is 3. So that means I'm looking for divisors of 2 to 3 minus 1, which is 7, and 7 is prime. So that means the order is 1, which is less than the degree, so the order is 7. No computation needed. Let's look at another case. So here we have a larger degree. So this LFSR has characteristic polynomial x to the 4 plus x plus 1. And fourth degree we have to watch out because it's not enough to check whether there's a root to find out whether it's irreducible, but we also have to do a trial division by x squared plus x plus 1, exactly the polynomial which is here in example 1. But once you've done all of this, you notice that this polynomial is irreducible. And now I've given you a case where the um, 2 to the degree is not a prime. So here we have that 2 to the 4 minus 1 is 15, which factors as 3 times 5. So we know that the order is one of the factors of 15, and we can exclude the 1, the 3 again, because it's less than the degree of the polynomial. But we have to check 5 in order to conclude it's 15. So let's look at 5. So here's how you compute uh, this by hand. I understand that for the exercise session you could use Sage or Paris or whatever you have around. But let's just do a simple calculation by hand how you would do it normally. So x to the 5 can split as x times x to the 4. I'm splitting off the x to the 4 because the polynomial model which I'm reducing has degree 4. So I would split off everything which is not degree 4. I, mean, I would divide by x to the 4, so I'm getting x here. And then I'm placing this x to the 4 
by x plus 1 because, well, in a compute modulo x to the 4 plus x plus 1, that means every x to the 4 is equal to x plus 1. Hence, this parentheses, they're saying x plus 1. Then I cross multiply, I'm getting x squared plus x. And that one is obviously not 1 because, well, there's an x term. So that means the order is not 5. And now, if I wouldn't have this math knowledge, I would have to go on and compute all kinds of other things. Well, I would have started with 4, exclude this, now I'd exclude 5, exclude 6, 7, <laughs> till you get to 15. Now, of course, if you can tell the computer to do this as a while loop, it's not so bad unless your degree is rather high. Now, in this case, 15 is not too bad, but it's still very convenient that I can just say, hey, the order is 1, 3, 5, or 15. I've excluded 1, 3, and 5, so the order is 15. So it's just a small uh, computation I've been doing to exclude all the small degrees, and I'm getting that the order is 15. Now, one example, which is uh, giving you another corner case. So here's another degree 4 polynomial. Um, it's again one which is reducible, and you can check that. So if you divide by x squared plus x plus 1, then you're getting x squared. Well, that takes away the first three terms, leaving x plus 1 as a remainder. So it's not the divisor, and you're checking that 0 and 1 are not roots. So yes, this polynomial is reducible. Um, same argument as before, um, that the degree is 4, and so we have that the order is in 1, 3, 5, and 15, and it's not 1 or 3. Now we'll check for 5, and here the computation is a bit longer, um, just because the polynomial has, uh, has more coefficients there. I was kind of nice in the previous one that I get x to the 4 plus x plus 1, so I didn't need another reduction. Here I'm replacing the x to the 4 with all the rest in this polynomial. So x to the 4 is the same as x cubed plus x squared plus x plus 1. So that goes in the parentheses there. And when I then cross multiply with well, just x there, then I'm getting another term x to the 4. And that means I have to again replace the x to the 4 by x cubed plus x squared plus x plus 1. Now a whole bunch of things cancel out, leaving me with just 1. Okay, so that means x to the 5 is common to 1 modulo this polynomial. Oh, I see there's a typo, it should be x to the 2 um, rather than x times 2. So this means in this case we have found a polynomial of order 5. So for irreducible characters polynomials, we now know the full story. We know that the order of the state matrix is the same as the order of the characters in polynomial. So that is already nice because we only have to deal with the polynomial and not with its two-dimensional object. We know that the order is achieved, that there is a sequence which has that length, and we know what numbers to search. So there is a limited list and, well, as you can see, sometimes it's very limited. It's just a prime, so since it's not one, it must be that prime number, or it is just down to one check or two checks. Now, a definition for this nice case that the order is full. So in the first three cases, we had that the order of this character's polynomial was we to the n minus one, which is maximal. Then we call this polynomial primitive. So the characteristic polynomial is primitive if it is irreducible and the order is 2 to the n minus 1. Now you might have heard about primitive polynomials before when you looked into the theory of fine fields. And actually these two definitions match. So if you, if you look at primitive polynomials in a fine field, then the definition was that if you're generating a fine field as the polynomial ring over F2 modulo its polynomial, well, first of all, to be a field, P has to be irreducible. And then you call this polynomial primitive if this x, so the variable there, generates the whole multiplicative group. So if you look at all the powers of x, then you run through all to the k minus 1. Well, here we have the same with a length n state and running through all to the 2 to the n elements. So these two definitions match. So if you have a primitive field polynomial, then you can take this as a definition of an FSR. So from the polynomial, you figure out where to draw the lines, how to add things up, and how to feedback. And then you're getting an LFSR of maximum period. 
And that's often exactly what you want because you must ensure that it doesn't repeat and so you want to have something which is max popular. So in principle, story is done. If you can choose your own LFSR, you just pick one where 2 to the n minus 1 um, is achieved. So you're picking a primitive polynomial p and then you do. However, well, in hardware design, you often have like small pieces or other things. And so it's not the full story, there will be more. And also, if you don't have a primitive, but just an irreducible polynomial, then we have another theorem, which, well, will be in a few videos, well, two videos, um, namely in the LFSR math mystery with this math video. Uh, I think I actually flipped the order, I think it's math versus mystery. Um, so what I'm showing there is that if, if P is irreducible, then all non-zero starting states give the same period. So in this example, which we had on the previous slide, where we looked and had hoped that we would get, get 15, but you only got 5, this p was irreducible, but we didn't get that it was primitive. But we now, if we leave this theorem, know everything by knowing just the order of p. So in this case here, we know that the polynomial has order 5, and that means, well, starting state as 0 gives you a period 5, and then there are two more periods, five, and then one extra one. Well, I mean, we need to reach two to the four, which is 16, and five plus five plus five plus one is 16. All right, that's it for today on the mathematical properties of LFSRs, and we're gonna have some more experiments soon, so stay tuned for more.